Hi everyone, welcome back to another lesson. We're talking about the parasitic infection known as clinorchiasis in this lesson. So clinorchiasis is going to be a very important infection to look out for because it's actually been described by the World Health Organization as one of the top neglected tropical diseases. And this is going to even potentially lead to certain types of cancer. We'll discuss all that later on in this lesson. So what is clinorchiasis? Clinorchiasis is going to be a condition caused by infection with a liver fluke species known as Clinorchus sinensis. So Clinorchus sinensis is going to be a trematode. Trematodes are these flat parasitic worms that often have a hook or suction cup mouth. And this particular liver fluke is also known as the Chinese liver fluke or oriental liver fluke. And individuals can get infected by this liver fluke through ingestion of undercooked or raw fish. So could be anything from sashimi or sushi or any dish where the fish is, hasn't been cooked enough that can lead to infection by this liver fluke. Now, this condition is going to be more prevalent in East Asia. It seems to be a condition that is primarily in the Eastern Hemisphere, again, East Asia. We can see it in countries like China, South Korea, and Vietnam, especially in more poor areas of these countries. In China, for instance, some of the provinces that are most affected by this liver fluke include Hunan province, Guangdong province, and Guangxi province. All those provinces are more likely to have exposure to this liver fluke. And it's estimated that 15 to 20 million people are infected by this particular liver fluke, and upwards of 200 million are at risk for infection. Now, when we look at who is more likely to get this infection, it seems to be that males are more likely to be infected than females, either due to differences in food handling or hygiene. There are some beliefs in some of these places where even though this liver fluke is known to occur, some individuals think that drinking alcohol along with eating fish can help kill or destroy the liver fluke before being infected. That's actually not the case. So there are some instances where perhaps males may believe that drinking alcohol along with their fish may offset the risk, but it actually doesn't. So there are some potential ideas or reasons for why males are more likely to be infected than females, but suffice to say, males are more likely to be infected. And infection risk actually increases with increasing age, and it seems to peak at the ages of early 50s. So let's briefly talk about the life cycle of this parasite to better understand how it survives and how it actually infects humans. So as mentioned before, the infection is caused by a consumption of raw or undercooked fish containing what we call metasarcarii. So metasarcarii are a particular stage of life for this parasite. And then what will happen is that metasarcarii will enter into the gastrointestinal system. So we swallow it down into the stomach and then it will actually mature in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, into an adult liver fluke. And we'll mention this here in a moment, but the adult liver fluke will actually enter into the patient's biliary system and reside there. The adults will release eggs and it usually can take up to three months before eggs are excreted in stool, although it could be as short as three weeks. And these eggs will then be released into fresh water. So what will then happen is that when these eggs get into the fresh water, the eggs are ingested by snails. So snails are actually going to be the first animal host for these new generation of parasites. And then inside the snail, that egg will then develop through multiple stages, eventually into the stage known as a cercarii. And the cercarii will then exit the snail. And the cercarii is free swimming. So it'll actually swim in the water source and then it will penetrate into a fish. Once it penetrates into the fish, it will then insist into the fish's flesh and will insist into the form of a metacercarii, which can then be eaten by a human in raw or undercooked fish and can also be ingested by other animals like cats and dogs if they're eating raw fish as well. So that's the brief overview of this life cycle of this parasite. So again, we talked about the fact that if there's a metacercarii in undercooked fish, when we eat it, it enters into the stomach. It will then exit the stomach and enter into the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. And in the duodenum, it's going to mature into an adult liver fluke. So here's another diagram, this time showing the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. Also 
having the pancreas and the biliary system, so the common bile duct, the gallbladder, and then also the liver in this diagram. The reason I show this is because once these adult matured liver flukes are in the small intestine in the duodenum after they've matured in the duodenum, they can actually then enter into the ampulla of Vader. They then travel up the common bile duct, they can impact the gallbladder functioning, and they can often reside in the intrahepatic biliary ducts. That's often where they're going to reside. So many of these liver flukes, depending on how much has been ingested, they can all enter into the biliary system and cause issues. Now, what often happens is that it takes about 10 to 30 days for the incubation period. So after you've ingested a metasarcaria, it takes roughly 10 to 30 days for the maturation of that metasarcaria into a adult liver fluke and then that adult liver fluke entering into the biliary system. It takes some time for that to happen. And even if you are infected, you may be asymptomatic, meaning you have no symptoms at all. It depends on how much has been ingested. If you've ingested a small amount, you may not have symptoms and they may be residing in your biliary system. If you've ingested many, you can start to have symptoms soon after the incubation period has ended. And also important to point out here is that the parasite burden can increase with increasing ingestion. So perhaps you ate raw or undercooked fish in the past, you get some of these liver flukes in your system, then you start to eat other contaminated fish products and that can just add to the parasitic burden. So that's also important to point out here. So in the case where you do have symptoms, if you've had a larger parasite burden, you've ingested many of these metasarcarii, you can start to have gastrointestinal issues. Some of these include nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, loss of appetite, malaise, just feeling unwell. So it can appear in some cases like a gastroenteritis. In more severe cases, if there's a lot of parasite load or if it's a chronic clonarchiasis, we can start to see liver issues. So because they enter into the intrahepatic biliary ducts, they can impact liver functioning because the liver actually creates, produces bile, and excretes the bile into the biliary system. If there's a lot of those liver flukes in the system, then biliary excretion can be impacted. There can be impaction of biliary functioning and also issues with liver inflammation and other damage to the liver. So that can lead to jaundice. So we can see a yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes. We can also see right upper quadrant pain and tenderness. So the right upper quadrant is here. If we look directly at the patient, look at their belly button. You split the abdomen into four quadrants and this is the right side of the patient. So this is the right upper quadrant. That's where the liver is located. So we can have pain in that area. And because the liver flukes are in the biliary system, they can impact the ability of the gallbladder to work. And this can lead to biliary stasis. So bile is not being excreted from the gallbladder properly and we can get development of gallstones and more specifically we can get development of pigmented gallstones. Pigmented gallstones are going to be black or brown in coloration as opposed to other types of gallstones. This can lead to gallstone disease. We'll discuss the different types of gallstone disease in the next slide. And then having those liver flukes in the biliary system can increase the risk of cancer. It can actually increase the risk for cholangiocarcinoma. So cholangiocarcinoma is going to be a cancer of the biliary system. And the reasons for this are believed to be either due to feeding habits of the liver fluke. Their feeding habits inside the biliary system can lead to damage inside the system. That can lead to potential metaplastic or dysplastic changes in the system or simply due to them being in there can lead to inflammation and or increase the risk of recurrent acute or ascending cholangitis. We'll discuss that here in a moment. So that's an infection in the biliary system. So repeated inflammatory episodes within the biliary system can also increase the risk of cancer as well. So those are some of the potential reasons as to why liver flukes can actually lead to cholangiocarcinoma. And in fact, because clonorchis sinensis infections increase the risk of cholangiocarcinoma, they have actually been described as a carcinogen. So these clonorchis sinensis liver flukes have been classified as group one carcinogens by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. So if a patient does get cholangiocarcinoma, some of the signs and symptoms they may experience include no symptoms at all. They could be asymptomatic in some cases. In other cases, they could have jaundice, so yellowing of the skins and the whites of the eyes, like we mentioned before. They could get abdominal pain. They could have unexplained weight loss. And they could also have itchy skin due to 
issues with biliary or bile salts. And they could also have changes in the coloration of their urine and stool. So they may have dark urine or pale stool. So that can all be signs and symptoms of cholangiocarcinoma, but some of these can also be signs and symptoms of types of gallstone disease, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Now let's discuss gallstone disease. Gallstone disease sort of acts like a spectrum, depending on where the gallstone is located in the biliary system. The first condition is what we call cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis simply means that the stone is in the gallbladder. It's often going to be asymptomatic, but we may see right upper quadrant pain, generally vague or dull pain with radiation to the right shoulder, especially after eating very high fat meals. So we may get a slight pang of pain and rating to the right shoulder as it irritates the phrenic nerve. The next condition is cholecystitis. Itis means inflammation, so it's inflammation of the gallbladder. And this is where the stone has now moved from its location in the gallbladder and it's now in the cystic duct. So the cystic duct is where the gallbladder connects to the hepatic duct to form the common bile duct. So when the stone gets into the cystic duct, the cystic duct is more narrow than the gallbladder, so it can often impact here. So there can be a blockage at that location. And then we're going to see certain signs and symptoms. Murphy's sign, we can see right upper quadrant pain and fever. And Murphy's sign is going to be a clinical sign where a clinician palpates or touches a patient's right upper quadrant, and then they have the patient take a deep breath in. And if the patient experiences pain with that deep breath, that's going to be a positive Murphy sign. The next gallstone disease is going to be cholelithiasis. So cholelithiasis is where the stone has traversed the cystic duct and is now blocking the common bile duct. This is going to lead to other potential issues because if we look at this diagram here, if it's if the gallstone is stuck in the cystic duct, well, the liver can still excrete bile and other components through the biliary system into the small intestine. But if there's a stone now blocking the common bile duct, now nothing can get through. So this is going to lead to jaundice, so yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes. That's the scleral ictris, that yellowing of the whites of the eyes. We can also see issues with dark urine coloration, and we can also see clay-colored stools. So the stool color becomes more like clay, it becomes lighter colored, whereas the urine becomes darker colored. So those are going to be some extra findings with regards to cholelithiasis. Patients can also have right upper quadrant pain and fever as well. And then another condition is ascending or acute cholangitis. So itis refers to inflammation. This is where there's inflammation of the biliary tree. So this is where we're going to have that gallstone stuck in the common bile duct. Nothing is getting passed. And now all of that content acts as a potential reservoir for bacterial growth. This is where we're going to have infection in that location. That can lead to other signs and symptoms, including what we call Charcot's triad. So Charcot's triad is where there's fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice. And then this can progress into something called Reynolds pentad. That's where there's a more severe case of acute or ascending cholangitis. And Reynolds pentad is going to have what we just mentioned, Charcot's triad, plus hypotension or low blood pressure and altered mental status. So those are potential findings in ascending cholangitis. Now, how do clinicians diagnose and treat Clonorchis sinensis infections? So the gold standard of diagnosis is going to be stool, ova, and parasites. So this is where we actually look for the eggs of Clonorchis sinensis in the stool. And it's important to note that it may not be that easy to detect the ova or eggs in a patient's stool because, for instance, if there are the Clonorchis sinensis liver flukes in the biliary system and there's some blockage, perhaps there is a stone in the common bile duct, and then you were to actually check the stool, the eggs might not even be able to exit out of the biliary system. So you're not even going to see them in the stool. So that's one thing. And then other times it may require multiple checks to see whether or not there are ova in the stool. Another potential test is bile and serum IgG4 levels or immunoglobulin G4 levels. This is one potential test that could be utilized because it does get elevated in Clonorchis sinensis infections, although it can be elevated in other parasitic infections as well. And then another really good one is going to be PCR, although this may not be available in all centers. And then we can also do some imaging as well. Imaging can be right upper quadrant ultrasound. 
So right upper quadrant ultrasound not only can help with visualizing gallstones, it can also potentially be utilized to see if there's any intrahepatic duct dilation. So that's one method. It's mostly going to be used for gallstone disease. ERCP of the biliary tract itself can also be utilized to look out for cholangiocarcinoma. It can also be used to potentially get an aspirate from the biliary system for testing as well. And some other imaging modalities can include CT or MR imaging. And with regards to MR imaging, for instance, we may see descriptions of too many intrahepatic ducts. And that's again because of the liver flukes being in the intrahepatic ducts and essentially leading to the dilation of those ducts. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat it? So the treatment is going to be with prazoquantil, prazoquantil 25 milligrams per kilogram, PO or by mouth, TID three times a day for two to three days. And another alternative medication can be albendazole, which can be 10 milligrams per kilogram for five to seven days. Depending on the parasite burden, multiple treatments may be required. Even after treatment has helped eliminate these liver flukes, there can still be some issues with biliary functioning. They can still have pigmented gallstones from the previous infection, or they can have other recurrent inflammatory issues in the biliary tree. So there can be long-term effects of having this condition even after it's been treated. So a lot of content in this lesson. If you need to try to look through it again, that can always help to solidify the information that you've learned. It's always important to do a quick review, especially of something you just learned. That can be very helpful. If you enjoyed this lesson, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Also, please consider joining memberships. Memberships are now available. We're going to have some very exciting and very different members-only content coming up in the future. So if you would like to join, please consider joining. I hope you all have a very good day and take care.